Hi, it's Dan the Real Estate Guy coming to you from the home office and today's topic is on checklists. Uh, if you know my story, you know that I flew for the Air Force for eight years. Uh, we depended on checklists. The checklist in the C-130 was a book. It was pretty thick. Uh, the C-130 has five crew members, three officers and two enlisted. And when you run a checklist, like before starting engines checklist, um, you know, before takeoff, everything, uh, each member has a response at certain parts of the checklist and it was a team and uh, it was really well done. Uh, the training in the Air Force was, I can't even say enough about it, it was superb. We were trained for everything in every situation. Uh, I had 18 in-flight emergencies and it just routine. You did it a thousand times in the simulator, it was just routine. You bring the airplane home, right? So checklists are important. And uh, as I worked in the real estate industry, and uh, sometimes I just didn't have enough checklist. You miss items, and it's a real bummer, all right? So I kind of developed my own. I encourage you to develop one as well. Um, we likely will have a file on, uh, on the membership site with some tools. I can put mine up, but I'm just saying the reason you should develop your own is that you can start with mine, but you might find in your area things are slightly different. There's different utility companies or they have to be called a different time. Uh, things could happen. So let's just run over mine. Um, when I'm buying a property, uh, depending on the method, and obviously if it's at an auction, it's just done right there and there's different steps. But if it's done regular where you're writing a contract or an offer on, to somebody, um, the first thing we're doing is getting that contract signed. Uh, right after that, we're opening escrow. Okay, after that we're getting a preliminary title report and we're making sure that there's nothing wrong with the title. There's an area on the report, you'll learn to read them, your uh, title officer can help you and you can see if there's any problems with the title right there. Um, you're going to in order insurance, you're going to have an insurance guy, I've been using the same guy for I think 18 or 19 years now. It's real simple, if you choose a good person and they understand what you do and how you do it, and as you develop volume, you'll have a systematic way of getting your guy to uh, put a binder, insurance binder, or whatever they need to put into escrow to make sure you have insurance. All right? Uh, you'll learn over time what you like for deductibles and you know how they like to insure it. And you know, a good insurance agent will understand your business. Usually, you will pay for six months or a year of insurance, even if you're going to sell that property right away. When you sell the property that's on your checklist, you're going to cancel the insurance after, it's, after you no longer own it. You're going to make that phone call or email, however you do it. You guys are going to work out a system. You're going to cancel the insurance and they're going to rebate you the portion of that year. If you paid for a year and you only own the property four or five months, you're going to get that other part back. All right? Something to think about. You're going to close that first escrow. As soon as you close the escrow, if you've got someone living in the property and you want them to vacate so you can fix it up and sell it, you're going to want to give whatever notice is required in your area, whether that's a 30-day notice, a 60-day or a 90-day. You're going to need to look up the requirements for uh, property management in your area um, and find out. They change these things from time to time. Ours got changed at one point. We had to give a 90-day notice uh, to certain groups and other people you didn't. All right? So you need to learn what that is. If your goal is to vacate the property, as soon as the escrow closes, you're on that. All right. Um, you're going to call utilities and make sure the utilities get switched over to your name. Often if you catch them in time, you don't have to meet them out there. You don't have to sit around with a four, four hour window of time to get some utilities turned on. And it, again, and your area could run different. So you should have a nice neat area of contact area. One of the contacts on your contact list is going to be your utility companies, whether there's a separate gas company, an electric company, a water company, um, whatever you need, you need to have all those phone numbers ready to go and know the procedure for getting it switched into your name so that if you meet your contractor out there in the next day or two, there's going to be power. He can't check some things without having power. So you don't want to run into that situation where you forgot to call the utility company and there's no power and your workers get out there and they can't work. You see, that's what checklists do for you. In the Air Force, they kept me from perhaps hitting the ground hard. <laughs> um, but here, they help you from making mistakes that cost time and money. Everything's time and money. Your contractor doesn't want to get his crew out there if they can't work. So that's why you're going to follow a checklist. All right. Um, if you're planning to retail that property, it's my suggestion you get a pest report right away. Find out what you're dealing with. You may have used a method that allowed you to get that through escrow or during the escrow or as part of your contract to buy, but often 
you're going to use an as is, where is cash purchase program and you don't care. You've maybe done some inspections, but you're not getting ready to clear the pest anytime soon. You're going to wait till you own it and then you're going to find out what your dry rot issues are or any other pest control issues. You're going to find that out so that perhaps your contractor can get that part done for you as well. Um, you don't have to use the pest company to do the work. We talked about that on other videos. I'm going to get a roof inspection right away, the next item on the checklist. If I've got a roof that I think is in question, uh, say it's a wood roof that's 18 to 19 years old in my area, it's getting close to being replaced. I need to know, can I get that thing certified for three years? Um, we're doing a little bit of repairs, maybe replacing some of those wood uh, shakes, or do we need to plan on a new roof? Now, I like to know that before I buy, obviously, but there's some areas of town where I'm confident that if I had to spend the extra money on the roof, I would get a little bit extra money on the price. Maybe not the entire amount of that roof, but some areas I would. I would get the full amount. I'd get eight to 10,000 more for that property if it had a brand new roof on it. So I'm not too concerned about that affecting my profit. All right, other parts of town, you don't get any more with a new roof than you do with one that's you know 10 years old or 15 years old. Um, so you have to be careful with that. But that's on my checklist. The next one is the repairs. I'm going to have a good list together. I'm putting my list together. I'm finding out what it needs. I'm uh, getting my bids. I'm figuring out what am I going to, you know, which crew am I going to use. You're going to develop several crews sometimes. You might have a crew that's great for heavy fixers, but they can't really save you money on a light fixer because they don't like those jobs. They get the crew out to work, they need to get paid, right? They don't like the light stuff. So you might have a handyman, you know, someone that can go change light bulbs and change fixtures and do light work that will work on a reasonable amount of money rather than a contracting crew that needs to be paid heavier, you see? So you'll develop that, all right? I'm, um, I'm already looking at possibilities for carpet, right? I'm already, usually I have three or four types of carpet I like to use, and um, in some case, in the old days, I just take my own measurements and go over to where I could buy it wholesale and buy it. So you'll develop your own sources. At the beginning, I think you should be really hands-on, all right? If you've got the time to be hands-on, you're going to learn your cost better, and you're going to keep your cost down better. You can develop better sources, better deals for your uh, materials. Next thing I've got on there is landscaping. I'm going to look at that hard and figure out what do I need to do based on if I'm going to sell that property, it wants to look a certain way. If I'm going to keep it as a rental, it just needs to be neat and clean and low maintenance. Right? So I'm working with my landscaper. I've used the same landscaper now for more than 10 years. And he kind of has a feel for what I like as well. So you're developing your team, you're developing your checklist, and you're going to put all this together to keep your transactions moving through the pipe. Okay? Um, electrical check. In some cases, if I'm suspicious or it has older uh, electrical uh, panel and things like that, I may need to get that checked out. Um, heat and air conditioning, same thing. Um, usually my contractor can do a heat and air inspection for a reasonable cost and figure out if there's anything we need to do to that to, that, to uh, get it running properly. Um, after the work is done and everything's dialed in, we're going to do a deep cleaning. That's the next thing on the checklist. I believe clean cells, you know, really clean. You want, uh, when you're done with that work, you want that property from clean from top to bottom. You want the exterior sharp. You want the interior sharp. Um, really give that buyer a clean home to look at. All right. Then we're going to do some listing paperwork and get that property listed. Remember in the early days I listed them with myself because I have a license. Um, now I, I have an agent that takes all my listings at a reduced fee because he doesn't prospect for listings, I just give them to him. Um, and we've worked out a, tr a fee for that and it works out pretty good. So um, he's going to be all over the listing paperwork. Um, and then we're going to get that thing on the market and get it sold. Uh, then we have an outbound. So we, in this particular thing we had an inbound checklist. We had a market preparation checklist, and now the bottom is what we call the outbound checklist. Um, we get the offer, we open the escrow, all right, we get all the information to the title officer, you get them a copy of the contract, you get things moving, all right? Um, we get the disclosures to the other side right away. Remember your disclosures, depending on what state you're in, what area, what you're doing, you know, you're going to have disclosures, you're going to get those to the other, to the buyer's side through their agent, if there's an agent involved, and that starts a clock running for them. So you want it on your checklist. You want to get it to them right away. Remember, they have a time period where they can review the disclosures and back out. So why wait a week to start their clock? Why not start the clock right after you accept the contract? Smart, huh? So you need to do that. You know, an agent's familiar with this. They know all the, the outs in the contract and how to get those contingencies and time frames met and then released. 
so that you're ready to close. All right. So they're following a checklist as well. You've got yours, your agent's got theirs. All righty. Um, we're going to make sure that deposit check goes into escrow, the buyer's deposit goes into escrow and gets cashed. I cannot tell you the number of times um, where if we had to work with a title company that we're not used to working with and they don't understand my importance of making sure that check is good and it's cashed and it's in escrow. I've had times where we've been in escrow 30 days and they said, oh, we never got the money, didn't you know? You know? That's not professional. We, if a buyer steps up and they say, I have a $5,000 deposit check and you accept the offer, that check needs to go into title right away and it needs to be cashed right away. You need to make sure that the buyer is real because after all, if the check bounces and I've seen that happen and it turns out they're not real. They had a bad agent that really didn't qualify them. They were living in a dream world and they couldn't afford the house. You want to bounce them out of escrow as fast as you can. So you're, you're, you're poking at them and making sure they're real, you know, and then you're keeping them in escrow and getting them closed. This is not a game for you. It's, well, it could be a game, I guess, but it's, it's, it's not for fun. It might be for fun, but it's also for profit. So you have to make sure you have a real buyer and one way is get, make sure that that check gets put in escrow right away and it gets cashed. Um, you're going to monitor the escrow then with updates, you know, there's contingency removals, the inspections, the appraisal, all the things that happen during an escrow, it's good for you to be up to date and know where you are on every transaction. I used to, and now I'm, I probably don't do it quite as often, but I used to basically look at my, I keep a whiteboard, I know today we all use computers, but I'm, I still like the old school method as well. I use a computer tracking form where all my transactions are, I have 15 of them going right now. I know which ones had what done as we go through, but I like to just look at a whiteboard. I have one down at the office for my boys as well. We used to do what we call a transaction review every day. Every day we'd go over the whiteboard and anything that needed to be done for each transaction. You'll order a pest control report here, boom, write it in red. On the board it's the only thing on red is the stuff that needs to get done. You go through 10 transactions or 15 transactions and you have red on each one, order a pest report, order a roof certification, contact the contractor on the bid on this one, turn the utilities on on that one. Then once the transaction review was done in the morning, the object of the day was to get the red off the board. Order the pest report, you now have a date, you can erase the red and you can put the date in blue or something, right? So the object was to get rid of all the red. Do it every day and things aren't missed. Right? So my son still uses some of these checklists down there and the whiteboard and the whole bit down there to keep things moving. All right, so we're going to monitor that escrow and get it closed and we're going to get paid. Remember, that's really the reason we're doing this, isn't it? Sure, it could be fun and it could be challenging and um, rewarding, but the pay, the reward is what you're really after. So you can go do more transactions, right? So you can provide for your family better. So you can maybe take a vacation or whatever you're after. All right, you've set your goals. You got to get the deals through the pipe, closed, and get paid. All right, and then move on. We would then take our contractor box off. We usually had a contracting box once the deal closed. The new buyer owns it. We need to get the multiple listing box off that the agent uses. We need to get the other box off that contractors use. We usually have those two. Um, we need to also call utilities again now and get it out of our name. We usually waited one or two days and reminded the other side that they need to call and put it in their name. Then we would do a follow-up call and make sure we're not paying that bill anymore. All right? You want to cut that off on the day of close. No more utility bills to us. All right? We would also then cancel insurance. Usually in the early days, the insurance guy liked to have a closing statement. So as soon as we got the closing statement, you could just fax it over. Today you'd scan it and email it perhaps. But you're letting them know with proof the closing date. You no longer need insurance. But if you forget that, they don't know. Right? You tell them two months from now, oh yeah, that one closed. A good uh, agent can use the, the uh, closing statement and get you reimbursed from the day that it closed. But why wait? Make it part of your checklist. So that's kind of it in a nutshell for me on this particular checklist. Um, I like to use checklists for just about everything. Um, it keeps you on track. It keeps you from missing important steps. Um, keeps you from trying to catch up later. So you're always thinking ahead. You're thinking, where are we today? Where are we going with this transaction? What, what can we get done today to keep it moving towards the close? All right? You can use checklists in other areas as well, you know, in finding transactions. You can go through different methods and develop checklists and always have methods in progress, always developing deals so that you can buy them to put them through this pipe, use your checklist, take them through, and get paid. 
I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.